you would, take your Bibles this morning and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 is where we're going to be as the uh, last couple weeks. Squirrel! And uh, so we had a little bit of a distraction from 2 Timothy chapter 2. And uh, so we, as I said, probably you'll never hear a message on squirrels again. And uh, if you're visiting, you just might want to go back a couple weeks on the internet and see that message on squirrels. And then last week we talked about something else as far as distractions. And uh, so we're getting back into Second Timothy chapter two today. So we're looking forward to this. It's a very simple message. And so Second Timothy chapter two. We're going to begin reading verses fourteen and fifteen. If you would follow along as I read those verses this morning, it says, "Remind them of these things, and charge them before God not to fight about words." This is useless and leads to the ruin of those who listen. Be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. Avoid irreverent and empty speech, since those who engage in it will produce even more godlessness, and their teaching will spread like gangrene. Hymenaeus and Philetus are among them. They have departed from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place and are ruining the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, bearing the inscription, The Lord knows those who are His. And let everyone who calls on the name of the Lord turn away from wickedness. We're going to concentrate on those first several verses there this morning in just a moment. But before we do that, let's go ahead and look to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank You for meeting with us this day. We thank You for that Your Holy Spirit is alive and working in our hearts and our lives to draw us closer to You this day. I pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts. I ask, God, that you would help us to be honest with where we're at in our walk with you. And, Lord, I just pray that as we pray often, Lord, that you'd bring conviction where conviction is needed, bring encouragement where encouragement is needed. But, Lord, we pray that your will would be accomplished through the preaching of your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, right away there in verse 14, it starts with two charges that were given here. The first one says, remind them of these things. And then it says, charge them before God. And it's an interesting thing to consider as you look at 2 Timothy over and over. He says that these things shall be a reminder. These things you're to remember. So over and over, he's encouraging the people here, his recipients, his audience, to remember what has been taught up to this point. So he says, remind them of these things. So what what things is he talking about? Well, I think it would give us just a moment to go back to the previous verses, beginning with verse 8. So he says, so don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me as prisoner. So the very first thing he says, I want you to be reminded of, to not forget, to remember, is to remember the testimony that you have in Jesus Christ. I'm sitting there thinking about these songs that we're singing this morning and uh, standing on the promises of God. Do we not have a testimony? If you've seen God do anything in your life, you have a testimony that you can remember, a testimony that you should never forget. Something that you get that God has given you so that you can re, uh, share that with others. Uh, how great thou art, as we sing about that. I hope they're not just empty words. I hope they're not just uh, something that we kind of go through the motions and, and mouth, but that we really re- truly think about how great God is. Uh, talking about whom shall I fear? We don't have anyone to fear if God is with us. God's word tells us if God be for us, who can be against us? Uh, who you say I am? I, I'm chosen. I'm redeemed. I. Think about all these things that God says that we are in Jesus Christ. We have something to be thankful for, and you know, we come into church, oh, but we're going to have a rough week. Everything's, uh, uh. Get over it. We all have rough weeks. I had a rough week. I'd like to sleep through the night one time in the last week, you know? I'd like to not get up six times. You know, it's a rough week. It is what it is, right? You're going to sit there and pity party over it, or you're going to get through it, right? At some point, we just have to make up our mind. We're going to be thankful for what God is doing, not worry about what we can't see happening. You know, I think about, God, you're so good. Do we really believe that? Do you really believe that God is good? Then let's act like it. Let's not worry about everything that we can see that's going wrong. The whole world is going wrong around us. Right? I mean, it is what it is. Who's going to change it? (laughs) Yeah, right. I don't see any hands going up. Amazing how we can't control so much of what happens around us. You're going to have to trust God with it, right? So let's get back to what he said. God, remind them. He says, first of all, he says, verse 8, 
Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, ascended from David according to my gospel, for which I suffered to the point of being bound like a criminal. Where's Paul when he's writing this? Where? In prison, in jail. How many would rather be in church than in jail this morning? Raise your hand. Right. Uh, well, praise God. That's all I can say. So he says, but the Word of God is not bound. Thank you. The Word of God is not bound. He said, this book has freedom. This book gives freedom. It's not bound. It's not locked up. And how many times throughout history has, has different monarchies tried to destroy? I mean, there you go back and read about the history of the, uh, of the Bible, and you will find that there have been person after person after person who's tried to destroy it. They've had Bible burnings in the middle of streets, and yet here we are, thousands of years later, still holding on to the Word of God. It's not bound. Think about that. And then he goes on, uh, verse 10. This is why I endure all things for the elect, so that they also may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus, which, with eternal glory. This saying is trustworthy. For if we died with Him, we shall also live with Him. If we endure, we also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will also deny us. He goes on, we talked about the picture of baptism and how we go under the water. We stand in the water, we form the cross, we go under the water, we're baptized like Christ. And we come up out of the water, we're risen like Christ in newness of life. God's Word says in 1 Corinthians 5, we are in, all those who are in Christ are a new creation. It says we mortified, we put to death the things of the old life. There's a new life. And we have so much to be thankful for. And he says, remember this. Don't forget this. And if I could just add my two cents worth, which is really not probably a good thing, but don't take it for granted. We have been given a gift that is so awesome, so powerful, so great. And life is just so humdrum. Get over it. Do it with me. Everyone put your hand up. Everyone put your hand up. Do it. Let's do it. It's not about me. Say it with me. It's not about me. It's all about Him. Right? Let's quit living like it's all about us. It's all about Him. So now we get into our passage. So he says, remember Jesus Christ, risen, descended, according to the Gospel. He said, this is why I suffer. This is why I'm in bounds, even though the Word of God is not bound. He said, so that the Gospel may go forth. He says, remind them of these things. And then he says, charge them before God. Can I just say charge as a charge before God that this is a challenge we all need to take not to forget? Not to forget. So now he gives us what it is that we're to focus on. He said, remind them of these things and charge them before God not to fight about words. Now, this is an interesting phrase here because it's not like what you think it is. Anybody ever seen anybody argue? You ever watched it? It's kind of childish, right? But that's really not what this is referring to. It's not talking about two kids who are arguing over a toy. It's not talking about two people who are saying who got that car parking spot first. It's not worrying about, you know, this is not child's play. This is arguing over the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is about doctrine. In fact, Paul says to warn them not to continuously, and this is the present tense, dispute the meaning or the use of certain words. You see, there are always going to be those who twist and and contort, and, contort and, and, and just try to do everything they can to change what the Word of God is saying. Uh, in fact, you can go on almost to any website on the Google, and you can find somebody who will believe what you want to believe, or will teach you what you want to believe. Uh, I mean, if you want to have this, this thought, but not this one, there's people who will teach that. You can find anybody to back up anything you want to say and believe. And he's saying, that's the trouble with this. He says, we're not going to argue over words or doctrine or theology. That's important. So Paul says, warn them not to continuously, this is the present tense, dispute the meaning or certain use of words. Paul was not referring to immature substance, distracting as that can be. Paul was warning about people who deceive, people who are false teachers, people who twist the truth of the Word of God, who might use human wisdom or reason, or what we would call arguing, to undermine God's Word. Author Ray Stedman notes that the word battles are a common trap in many modern-day churches. Word battles. Folks, may it not be said of us that we're arguing over doctrine, that we're arguing over truth. Hopefully, and I say it all the time, it's not being, in being a Baptist or a Catholic or a Lutheran or a Church of God, Church of Christ, or anything else under the sun. 
Primarily, it's under being a relationship with Jesus Christ. Can we agree with that? Now listen, I'm thankful for my Baptist heritage. But the problem is the rest of the world doesn't know what a Baptist is. The rest of the world, what does Baptist mean? In some circles, Baptist is this. In some circles, Baptist is this. In some circles, Baptist is this. It's all twisted and contorted. I want to be a Biblicist. If you push me, I'm a Baptist. But I want to first be a Biblicist. And so the reality is, I want to follow the Bible more than anything. And I want to make sure that we are standing and arguing over this more than your opinions, more than your thoughts, more than your experiences, more than what you think. Because as we said this morning in Sunday school, this word is not of any private interpretation. This is God's word. And that's where we stand. So Ray Stedman goes on to say, the words in question, of course, represented doctrinal viewpoints. The church has often struggled with trying to define doctrine in words. And the words themselves are all right, but what is wrong is the battles that are waged over the words. Church should not be a place where we come in and argue. Think about that for a minute, folks. Uh, I've said for many years, I said it in my first church, I said it in my church plant, if I hear people fighting and griping over stupid stuff, you're going to have a little conversation with me. Deal with that in the world. Go out in the world, there's, there's anger and frustration and anxiety and hurt feelings and people who have diarrhea of the mouth and they just go off. That should not be in the church of God. And I'm thankful that we have a great spirit here. I'm thankful that we have a great unity here. I'm thankful that we don't have people fighting with each other. I think I told you last summer, I had a pastor friend of mine call me and goes, man, I had a fist fight in the parking lot of the church the other day. I'm like, good night. Are you serious right now? To my knowledge, we've never had that. And to my knowledge, I don't ever want that. But church ought to be a place of rest where we come in and encouraged and are lifted up and, and edified, Right? Leave the garbage outside. Leave the fighting outside. Leave the arguing outside because I don't want it inside. And neither does God. It should be a place of unity and harmony. So he goes on here. So what's wrong with the battles are the, what's the battles that are waged over the words. Let's make sure that if we're going to battle, we're battle over truth. And that we want truth in our midst. So he goes on and tells us why. So in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, says, Remind them of these things. Charge them before not to fight over words. Why? First of all, this is useless. It's useless. Have you, ever been, have you ever been in such a deep argument and you're just trying, why can't they figure out what I'm trying to say? Why can't they get it through the thick skull? Why can't they? You ever had that argument with somebody? I have. Unashamedly, because you're not getting anywhere. A person convinced against their will is of the same opinion you're not going to change people's mind. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Only the Word of God can do that. I've argued Scripture over with people, and I thought to myself, why did I do that? That was a complete waste of time. It was useless. Because they're not going to change. People have their opinions, and often, apart from God working in their hearts and in their lives, you're not going to change them. We stand where we stand. We stand up for righteousness. We stand up for truth. And we proclaim it but I'm not going to sit and argue over it. That's a different subject. So he says, first of all, fighting over words is useless. They're futile. It's, worth, it's of no profit. So arguing never leads to spiritual edification. I want you to think about that for a minute. When have you been in just a knockdown, drag out argument and somebody was spiritually edified over that? Raise your hand. Husbands, wives, you ever had just a knockdown, drag out and God was just glorified through that? No. Satan's like, whoo give me another bucket of popcorn. Woo! But no one is ever spiritually charged for good because of arguing. God is not glorified, and I'll just say it. We have groups downtown Rochester that go out and, you know, anybody does any street preaching, they're out there, you know, yelling at them, screaming at them in the name of Jesus. Come on. God is not glorified over that. And when you're out there holding the sign saying God hates fags, as some Baptist churches do, God is not glorified over that. And as much as I hate abortion, calling people murderers is not going to win them. It's not. It will confront them. And I'm not saying I have a better plan, but I'm just saying it's the truth. 
but you're not going to win them by calling it to their face. Not going to happen. There are things you can do. But folks, when we argue over this stuff, God is not glorified through it. God is not edified. Nobody who walks away spiritually charged because, oh, I called somebody a bigot. No. God is not, God is not rejoicing over that. We have to choose what we do with wisdom and with knowledge of God's Word to make sure you're doing it right, even though it's true. We said oftentimes, what is gossip? Saying things that don't need to be said. We said, well, it's the truth. It doesn't matter. Just because the truth is that it need to be said always. I mean, the newspaper does a good job of promoting things that don't need to be said, even though they're true. How many want to, you know, has, a, has, a, has ever had somebody who got a DUI or been pulled over and it's like front and center on the newspaper. You ever saw that before? You think to yourself, my stupidity is known by the whole world now. Boy, this is just wonderful news, isn't it? No. Arguing never leads to spiritual edification. Remember that. Lots of verses that talk about it. That's why he goes all the way back to 1 Timothy and over and over talking about our words. And number two, fighting over words leads to ruin. God's Word says this in verse 14 at the end of this. It says, This is useless and leads to the ruin of those who listen. I found in the past that when I want to push my point to make sure that they understand what I'm saying for the 17th time, all it does is push them further back. Anybody ever noticed this before? When you sit back after the fact, it just pushes them away. Parents, how many times have you gotten in an argument with your kids? You knew you're right. There's no question of whether or not you're right. But because you had to push your point 17 times, all you did was push them away. I've done it. Folks, sometimes we need to sit stop. What does Proverbs 16 say? A soft answer turns away wrath. How many remember the movie that came out on abortion a few months ago? Anybody go see that? I forget the name of it. Um, but it was a powerful movie powerful movie. And it's kind of interesting because I got to meet the, uh, the law firm that, that defended that and shut down Planned Parenthood there in Bryan, Texas. We got to see them a little bit. But the interesting thing about it is that as they stood against the fences of the abortion equipment, they didn't sit and scream and yell at them with, with hateful vengeance. They held their signs. They said, can we pray for you? Hey, can we talk for a moment? The soft answer was what did it for many. The soft answer of just consistency and faithfulness and pointing them to the scripture is what changed the hearts of many. Calling people names in the name of Jesus and fill in the blank for whatever the cause may be. Calling people names for the cause of, in the name of Jesus is not going to accomplish anything for the cause of Christ. We have to be careful. Fighting over words leads to ruin. People get tired of the arguing. They get tired of you having to be right. They get tired of having to listen to it. And all it does is further them the distance between you and them and what you're trying to accomplish. So it's going to require prayer. Number two, words must be correctly taught. And we see this in verse 15 in our text. Verse 15 says this, Be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. So words must be correctly taught. And what that means is several things. Number one, be diligent. Be diligent. If I were to ask every one of you in this room just a simple work question, and here's the question. What does it mean to be diligent? If you were to tell your children to be diligent to school, what does that mean? If your employer were telling you to be diligent to your job, what does that mean? If you were telling your college student to be diligent in their studies. What does that mean? You see, all of us has a general idea of what it means to be diligent, right? So let's put that definition that's in your head right now back into it. It says, be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved. So he says, be diligent as a child of God to study the Word of God. So he makes it very clear. So Stephen Cole, he's an author, he says, what is the key, the, what the key is for a saint to be diligent to rightly divide the word? So many Christians are haphazard and lazy rather than diligent in their approach to God's word. Don't raise your hand, but would you agree? You see, because preachers are required to be diligent. Missionaries are required to be diligent. 
Sunday school teachers are required to be diligent. But me, I sit here every Sunday morning and I listen. It has nothing to do with it. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. If you're a child of God, you're to be... Hey, thank you. You're to be diligent in the Word of God. I've actually heard some of you say things like this. Well, I pray a lot. I don't really have time to read, but I pray a lot. Well, is one, in a, one a substitute for the other? What kind of a statement is that? I'm still trying to figure that one out. Well, I, don't, I don't read a lot, but I pray a lot. Okay, so what's your point? God calls you to study and be diligent to the Word of God. Anybody agree? Thank you. Well, I don't really study. I, I read, but I don't, I, I don't really study it because, you know, I just don't understand it. You know how many tools have been given to mankind to help us understand this? Apart from the Holy Spirit that you have within you as a child of God, which said, I will bring all things to remembrance of whatsoever I've taught you. He says, if you have the Holy Spirit, he's going to teach you the things that you need to know. So if you're not learning anything, you got a question when not you got the Holy Spirit. I don't want to go there, but you've you got to have to. Do you have the Holy Spirit? If you do, you should be able to understand it because he said the Holy Spirit is what's there to help you learn it. Get a little quiet in here. So, so many Christians are haphazard and lazy rather than diligent in their approach to God's Word. They don't systematically read, study, or memorize it. If they read it at all, they jump from passage to passage, pulling verses out of context, and they aren't seeking to know God and how He wants them to think, to believe, and to relate to others. Their lives and relationships are falling apart, but they don't search diligently to discover what God's Word tells them to do about these problems. How many believe the Word of God to be 100% true? Don't be ashamed of it. You believe it? Amen. How many of you believe that this answers all of life's questions? Raise your hand. So that means if, it has, if it's true and it answers all of life's questions, you have what, it, have what you need to get through this life. Amen? Let's act like it. Let's live like it. Let's, let's, let's believe like it. So he says, first of all, be diligent. And then he says, as one approved. This is where it's really cool. Approved. What does that word approved mean? It means different things in different contexts, but it all comes down to the same thing. The word approved means purified, tested, and carefully examined. Just go with me just for a moment. Put, the, put your thinking cap on just for a moment. First of all, purified. When we think of the word purified, we think of a process called purification. And often in Scripture, it's referring to the dross that is removed when the heat is applied to precious metal. Think about that just for a moment. Purified means that the dross has been removed. The impurities have been removed. That means that the gold is worth more. The silver is worth more because the impurities have been taken out. But the only way for the impurities to be able to be removed is with what? Heat. I don't know about you, but I don't like heat in my life. Seriously. Does anybody enjoy trials? Anybody like going through difficult things? Anybody wake up in the morning and say, Woo, today's a good day to just buckle down and go through some struggles. Woo! None of us does that if you have a sane mind. None of us enjoys difficulty. We pray for a life of ease. We pray for things to get better. We pray that the struggles will be minimal. I don't know I'm saying it's wrong. None of us looks forward to, forward to difficult things. But according to God's Word... You can only become purified. The, the, the value of the gold only goes up as the heat is applied. Your worth, your value, who you are in Jesus becomes greater when we go through the struggle, when the heat is applied, so to speak. But it doesn't just mean purified. It also means tested. In fact, James speaks to this. I know I haven't used a lot of Scripture for a change today. Some of you are saying, wow, I'm not flipping all over the whole Bible this morning. That doesn't happen. Don't worry. Next week's coming. Verse 12 says, Blessed is the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. There is a reward that comes from going through the test if you handle it correctly. See, we can gripe and complain through it, or we can say, God, what is it that you're trying to teach me through it? 
I don't know about you, but there's a lot of things going on that I would not pick. I would not choose. In fact, I just get a little upset and frustrated at God sometimes that He's allowed it because I think I've already been through that one before. I don't need it again. Right? I've already had that one. I don't want that one again. God, if you're going to give me one, give me a new one once. I mean, that, obviously He still says, says oh, you've got some things you've got to learn here yet. I don't want to learn them. But once again, the reward comes after the struggle. And then he says, means, means carefully examined. And the word picture I want to get in your mind is this. I can remember as a kid, just a young punk, and uh, I, I keep threatening to do it again someday. I don't know if my brothers and sisters remember this, but in Arkansas, there is Craters of Diamonds State Park. As you're going down the highway, there is a big state park called Craters of Diamonds State Park. When we were kids, just little punks, we went over there and we spent the day digging for diamonds. I'm telling you, that place has been going on for decades. And they're still finding diamonds. In fact, about a year ago, someone found like an eight-carat diamond in there. Just digging, you know, and they're digging and digging. I mean, that place has been dug over eight million times. And they're still finding diamonds. But you know why a lot of diamonds get overlooked? Because they don't look like diamonds. They don't look anything like diamonds when you find a real diamond in the dirt or in the rough. They're all ugly. They're dirty. They're not cut. They're not cleaned. Sometimes they're brown. Sometimes they're purple. Sometimes they're blue. Sometimes they're yellow. Sometimes they're gold or amber. And they don't look like diamonds. And so people see them, they think, ah, it's just a stone. They push it aside. Oh, it's just a rock. They push it aside. But here's the thing. When that same diamond is handed to a jeweler and they begin to shape that stone, and then when they're done shaping it, they begin to polish that stone, what happens to the value of that rock? Exponentially goes up. Right? So I women the world over are wanting a stone in their ring. You see, to be approved means to be purified. It means that heat has to be applied. To be tested means that you have to go through some struggles. And you have to fight your way through them with God's help. To be approved means to be carefully examined like a fine jewel. And it's only after it has been shaped and polished that the value comes. Are you approved before God? Because you have diligently searched the scriptures. And then he goes on and gives us one more word picture. As a workman, and this is the idea of someone who works the field. Somebody who is not afraid to hard work. Man, I tell you, there are people who run from work, man. They are supervisors to high heaven, man. They say, ah, oh, they joke about it. Say, Somebody's got to supervise, and, you know, they don't want to get their fingers dirty. They don't want to get their, you know, arms working hard. They don't want to sweat. You're not a workman. He says that a workman is one who's not afraid to get dirty. He's not afraid to work the field. He's not afraid to get in and toil and sweat. So he says, Here's, here it is. Be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed. He's not ashamed because he, he knows the value of a hard day's work. He's willing to work the field. He's willing to toil. But what's the context in which all these things are given? The Word of God. Folks, many of us, just like Stephen Cole said, have been half-hearted and lazy when it comes to studying the Word of God. You should read through it. You should devote some of your time to reading it and applying it and to ask questions and to learn from it and to grow from it. Otherwise, there's some shame. So it goes on to verse 16 and 17. Avoid irreverent and empty speech, since those who engage in it will produce even more godlessness. The, the word avoid here means two things. It literally means to go around and to evade. So in other words, I'm walking here and there's a big pothole here. I'm not going to walk in. I'm going to go around it and keep going. I'm going to evade that obstacle. 
He says it literally means to avoid it, to go around it, to evade it. But what is it that we're to avoid and to evade? He says it. Irreverent and empty speech. Things that don't matter. Talk that doesn't produce a godly effect. Idle words. And he says, here's the deal. He says, irreverent teaching spreads like gangrene. I don't know if you've ever literally seen gangrene before. It's not a pretty thing. If you've ever seen it, you won't forget it. You say, well, is it a big nasty thing that you just never can get out of your sight or your mind? No, not necessarily. At least the gangrene that I saw wasn't. It was a red line of infection that was traveling up the leg. And from what I've been told, and what the doctor told me concerning someone that I loved, was that the only way to get ahead of the gangrene is to cut off in front of it. So I can remember when my dad was in the hospital and he got an infection. It was coming up his leg. Um, I said, we have to get above it. Get above it. Amputate above it. Because other than that, it was going to keep spreading. Gangrene is infectious and hard to get rid of. So once you start down that road of arguing and using irreverent words and just fighting to fight because you have to prove your point and get your point across, it begins to spread like gangrene. It's infectious. It doesn't produce anything godly. It spreads effortlessly, really. It spreads really easy. All I have to do is just leave it alone and it'll keep festering. And it also causes, according to verse 17, or verse 18, they have departed from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place. It, irreverent teaching spreads like gangrene, and irreverent speech causes some to lose their faith. Why? Because they're immature. You see, if you have to sit there and prove your point to somebody and make them believe something they don't really want to believe, the reality is they're immature anyway. But you don't have to prove your immaturity by pushing your point across them. You have to guard against that. I don't know about you, but I can remember my younger days. I liked a good argument. Bring it on. Anybody else? Come on. A bunch of you are lying. That's okay. You can deal with that later. I know you're good arguers. I've heard something. No, I kidding. The reality is we've got to be careful with our words. Let the Word of God speak. It says, let the word of God dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing, according to Colossians. God didn't call us as Christians to argue with everybody. We're to stand firm, know what you believe and why you believe it, search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so, as the Brians were. But he has not called us to sit there and argue with everybody who disagrees with us. State the truth. Let the truth go forth. Let the Holy Spirit use. Because remember, isn't that the job of the Holy Spirit? Isn't it, really? To take what's said so that it doesn't return void? God can do far more with the Word of God than what you can do with it. The Holy Spirit can do far more with it than what you can do with it, arguing with somebody and turning them away. You say, well, what is apologetics? Shouldn't we be Christian apologetics? D different subject. It's one thing when someone wants to have a discussion, but it's another thing that for you to push your point across somebody who doesn't want to hear. Two different, two different directions. Stand firm, but do it in wisdom. Folks, we have got to learn these things. I have found in this stage of my life, uh, arguing doesn't get you anywhere. I tried, I tried, <laughs> trust me, I tried. And God just keeps reminding me. You're just pushing people away. I'm terrible with this as my kids sometimes because anybody else a dad that has to be right? Come on. Any other dads that have to be right? Come on. Thank you, all three of you. Your kids are sitting there going, yeah, that's my dad. Trust me, they are. Because we've been there. We've done that. We bought the t-shirt. We wore it out. We know the truth. So what? I can't, I've never yet been able to change one person's heart. In 25 years of standing up in front of people teaching the Word, I have not been able to change one person's heart. I've won a lot of games of mercy. 
I've been bigger than a lot of people. I can inflict my will upon people in games and wrestling. But I've never in 25 years of being a pastor changed one person's heart. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And I found over the years, if I got to twist someone's arm to do something, I have to keep twisting them to keep doing it. Or as soon as I let go, they're going to stop doing it. God has taught me that I can't force my way across people. Because everybody has their own free will. They have their own ability. They have their own will. And if you don't submit to the Spirit and let the Holy Spirit work in and through you, you're, the only other alternative is that you're operating in the flesh. And that will accomplish nothing. Right? Folks, I don't know about you. The Word of God is true. It hasn't returned void yet. God's going to do what God's going to do. And you can do it with His blessing, or you can be kind of pushed into his mold. But one way or the other, God's going to get his way, right? Folks, I don't know about you, but we need to be students of the word. Rightly dividing the word of truth as one approved, which literally means be diligent, be approved, that means purified, tested, carefully examined, and then we're to be reverent. Avoid, evade, go around, that which would spread like gangrene. The truth of God's word. Why? Because if someone's not mature, they're going to depart anyway. And we don't want to see people departing before we have an opportunity to have impact. Amen? Let's pray.